Thank you so much for welcoming me here today. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back to Alabama, and I'm honored to be able to participate in these talks. It's last time I was at the archives, um, there was still renovation and construction going on, so it's pretty cool to come back and see how beautiful everything is. Some of you may know the the sort of struggles that they were having over in Georgia with the archives keeping their archives open. So I'm really delighted to see that the folks of Alabama have a little bit better sense. Um, I would. I'd like to thank Sherry and Debbie for making it possible for me to come and share my work with you today. And I'd like to dedicate my talk today to the memory of Ricky Bruner, who was um, a really a wonderful um, helper for me when I was here doing research back in 04 and 05. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the indigenous people on whose ancestral homelands were convened today and their modern day descendants both here and elsewhere. So the title of my talk today is A Crowd of Strangers, Immigration into Alabama After the Creek War. And the phrase, a crowd of strangers, comes from a letter by Israel Pickens, who uh, was, of course, a governor of Alabama. And those letters are housed here at the archives. I'm going to try to highlight a few of the materials as I move through the talk today um, that I was able to... <laughs> that I was able to, um, to use when I was here doing research um, several years ago. Uh, Pickens was among the more prolific travelers who came into Creek country following the conclusion of the Creek War, and I found his reflections on travel to and through the Creek Nation very useful as I tried to understand what motivated Americans to come to this region and how Creek people reacted to the presence of these newcomers. So today I'd like to talk about these strangers and why they came, what they experienced and what their presence meant for Creek sovereignty in the South following the Creek War. The Treaty of Fort Jackson that marked the formal end of the Creek War, or Red Stick War, not only drastically reduced the size of the Creek Nation, but it also expanded Americans' right to build and maintain roads through what little remained of Creek homelands although they would be relatively slow in so doing. In fact, even though American immigration through Creek country increased dramatically in the years after the war, the routes of travel, including the old federal road, which many of you may be familiar with, remained largely unimproved, if not neglected. Nevertheless, the spirit of immigration was high. On his journey through the southern states in 1817, writer James K. Paulding remarked, I had heard much of the continued migration from the Atlantic coast to the regions of the West, and I've now had some opportunity of witnessing the magnitude of what he called this mighty wave, which knows no retrograde motion, but rolls over the land, never to recoil again. In the period following the close of the Creek War, there was a massive and continued immigration into the Trans-Appalachian region. In this increasingly agrarian West, the primary enterprises were cultivating staple crops like cotton, corn, and sugar, and raising hogs and cattle. Nearly all of these products were transported on rivers and newly opened roads to and from the market hubs of the South and West, places like Natchez, New Orleans, and St. Louis. Eastward migrants saw the availability of recently acquired Indian lands as an opportunity to stake their claim in the new market economy and they proceeded by the wagon load into even the most suspect of Western sessions, or purchases, as they called them. Despite fears of yellow fever and a general belief in the insalubrity of the climes, a phrase that I love, Alabama fever infected the Eastern states like an epidemic, and great numbers of migrants headed out or started for former Creek lands. Of this trend, one foreign correspondent wryly observed, when people set out to go anywhere in this country, it is called starting. Thus they start to the westward, for the people of this country are the most active in the world and do everything by a start. By 1817, prospective settlers from as far away as Kentucky were pestering the surveyors of the Creek Session for information on the boundary lines, indicating their eagerness to immigrate. The demands of new immigrants heading into the Alabama Territory and toward the newly created state of Mississippi required significant improvements to thoroughfares like the Federal Road. And the Federal Road was at that time still the primary route for military and civilian travelers. But because of repeated failures on the part of the federal government to ensure that Creek leaders receive the remuneration guaranteed them, 
many were less than eager to welcome new travelers. Secretary of War George Graham noted, the citizens of Georgia and travelers complain much, not only of the road, but of the impositions which they are subjected to by the Indians. As the chiefs of the Creek Nation have refused to permit our citizens to establish public houses and ferries on the road within their limits. And indeed, the Creek headmen had reminded Graham in March 1817 that the right to such establishments and the profits to be had from them were guaranteed to the Creeks in the Treaty of, eight of uh, 1805, the Treaty of Washington. As they had before, the Creek chiefs explained to Graham once again, you have got a public road on our land, on our country, which we do not want the white people to settle on or live. We believe we are able enough to furnish the travelers with corn and provision. Despite these setbacks, by 1818, American travelers were taking to westward roads like never before. Augustine Harris Hansel recalled his boyhood on the Federal Road, saying, we met almost daily caravans of 15 and 20 one-horse covered carts going westward, each containing a whole family with a spinning wheel on the back and a dog underneath. And the boys would question the men as to where they came from and where they were going, with the almost unvaried reply, from Anson County, North Carolina, bound for the new purchase or bound for Alabama. <coughs> While certainly not all of the westward migrants were from Anson County, North Carolina, many were from one of the Atlantic states, including Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. And they made a fair start, as they put it, along the Indian roads, taking their families, black and white, to a new world which promised so much to industry and enterprise. In fact, the number of immigrants heading for the new purchase was so great that one family was forced to wait their turn with a horde of others at no fewer than three river crossings on their way through Creek Country. At the Chattahoochee River, they reported the flat was gone, the rope was broke, and the river was high. Waiting on the riverbank were 22 wagons and carriages, as well as several hundred cows and hogs. The population of the Alabama Territory grew at an extraordinary pace increasing from about 10,000 in 1810 to nearly 120,000 less than 20 years later. Of this total population, about 50,000 were slaves. Pickens described a monstrous number of immigrants pouring into the Alabama country and noted, we passed many wagons and other carriages, such as the crowd of strangers. The glowing claims of promotional literature and travel guides notwithstanding, the trip across Creek Country was still exceedingly dangerous. To say it was uncomfortable would also be an understatement. The larger the party, the more difficult the journey. Pickens complained, the road was bad beyond conception. And he recalled passing innumerable wagons and carriages stuck in the mud along the way. Despite recent improvements on the federal road between Georgia and New Orleans, Pickens described the route as one of miserable, dreary wilderness. John Owen, migrating from Norfolk County, Virginia to Tuscaloosa, Alabama Territory, repeatedly recorded in his diary, the infernal roads, bad roads, worst I ever saw, roads intolerable, roads very bad, and broken roads. The condition of the roads was so deplorable that their wagons stuck several times, the wagon tongue broke, and on at least one occasion, the whole contraption was overturned. The difficulty of the trip, a distance of nearly 775 miles that took nine weeks to complete, was so exhausting that Owen remarked more than once, my wife more fortitude than myself, ashamed of it. For other immigrating families, the hardships of the trail were far more serious. One party removing from North Carolina to Alabama had their wagon overturned in a rut along the road, causing the death of a 13-year-old child who perished when a heavy barrel of flour was tossed from the wagon onto her head. As a result of such frequent difficulties, the condition of the roads leading through the South, including those passing through the Creek Nation, was a topic of considerable public discussion during the decade following the Creek War. An editorial reprinted in the Georgia Journal complained that the public roads were in a constant state of disrepair and observed to hasten their crops, people are very willing to neglect the very roads along which the produce must pass to market. This incongruous lack of interest in the roads meant that it was, as this correspondent put it, 
10 times as easy to hit a stump as to miss one. And the ruts are so deep that you might imagine the wheels are semicircles. He concluded by advising all travelers heading into the nation to take out an insurance policy and to, quote, thank his stars for any fortunate combination of circumstances that is able to keep his soul case from being shattered to pieces. Some of the wealthier immigrants set out on tours through the creek lands, the ceded lands, to determine the best location for their farms and plantations. Like other men of great capital, Pickens sent his slaves onto Alabama in the care of an overseer to settle on the farm that he had purchased. For men like Pickens, slaves, particularly experienced men, functioned as a sort of venture capital, sent out at no small risk to form the first layer of investment in the new western lands. Their success or failure would determine the potential growth of the entire enterprise. Others, like Virginian John Owen, brought his three or four slaves along with him and his family on his overland journey to the Alabama Territory. Once there, he added to his slave property. On his journey from Richmond, uh, English correspondent William Tell Harris observed, we are continually passing families, sometimes in large bodies, removing with their furniture and Negroes to the Alabama. These enslaved peoples were westward immigrants of a kind, but unlike the white migrants who moved along the same paths, they were westering without hope. Large parties of slaves were sometimes forced to travel with slave traders, determined to make their fortune in the New Jerusalem, like as they called the, the Western territories, like the planters that they hoped to supply. The image of slaves driven by traders in coffles along creek country roads emphasizes the degree to which they were conceived of as property, like livestock, hogs, or horses, also sent along the southern roads under their own power and deemed essential to the economic development of other transportable wealth in the form of staple crops. Indeed, the slave trade was crucial to the development of southern commercial routes in the post-war years. One observer exclaimed, there is no branch of trade in this part of the country more brisk or more profitable than that of buying and selling Negroes. Although vast numbers of slaves intended for sale in the southern market were later transported by sea and sold in New Orleans and other ports, this was an expensive method of transport. And at least until the 1830s, bringing them through, as it was called, was considered preferable. Despite fears that they might escape into the Indian towns along the way, bringing the slaves on foot was not only cheaper, but it was believed to permit a gradual adjustment to regional climatic differences. Enslaved men were typically chained together in coffles, with women and children occasionally allowed to ride in wagons. They often numbered in the hundreds. The sick, the elderly, and the very, very young were often absent from these traveling flesh marts, although pregnant women would be included because of the higher prices they could command. Long trains or droves of slaves like these were a common sight on the roads that led from Virginia and the Upper South to the southwest through the so southern landscape, through Creek Country, on the Federal Road, and beyond. An early historian of Alabama noted that while the period from 1817 to 1830 was one of rapid immigration to the area, the increase in the white population paled in comparison to the increase in the number of colored inhabitants, as he put it. Indeed, as I argue in my book, the slow change from creek country to cotton country might be most accurately mapped in terms of the number of African-descended people forced to populate former Indian lands. This crowd of strangers, white and black, that pressed into the Old Southwest during the 18-teens through the 1820s depended on the availability of land vacated by the creeks after the termination of the Red Stick War. While many millions of acres had indeed been given up to the United States as part of the Fort Jackson Agreement, Creek people had by no means given up their claim to their homelands. Much of the interior region was still Creek country, and Creek men and women continued to make it their own, even as wider roads brought more and more strangers to their lands. The presence of greater numbers of travelers in the Creek Nation also meant that there were expanding opportunities for Creek entrepreneurs. While the war and the hostilities along the Seminole frontier had been devastating for Creek country, men and women of the nation continued, as they had done for generations, to adapt and exploit the new conditions they faced. 
travelers and often surveyors as well, needed supplies, provisions, guides, and lodging. And Creek men and women were sometimes called upon to provide these necessaries. Some Creek men also acted as slave catchers, securing fugitives who had escaped during transport uh, or from plantations in neighboring states. In addition, some of the best positioned Creeks managed to make handsome profits by operating ferries and stages along thoroughfares like the old Federal Road. But in truth, it was only the elite Creeks, men like William McIntosh, Sam Manack, Big Warrior, and Alexander Cornells, for example, who were wealthy enough to establish and run public houses and other facilities for travelers. As a result, they benefited most from the increasing American travel through the Creek Nation. Big Warrior maintained a stand on the Federal Road whose daily operations were overseen by his slaves. Alexander Cornells hosted travelers at his plantation, also situated along the Federal Road. Not to be outdone, McIntosh began construction on a new road from Kimmelgee on the Cahusa River to one of his plantations on the Chattahoochee. An advertisement for the new route that circulated in Southern papers emphasized the great benefits it would offer to American travelers. It read, there are good ferries and bridges so that travelers need not be apprehensive that they will be detained on the road by high water. The accommodations on the road will be good, and as the Indians have made large crops, there is no doubt that corn may be purchased at any time on the road for less than $1 a bushel. The Indians referred to in this newspaper notice were probably not individual Creek men and women engaged in small-scale daily exchanges with travelers, but were instead the large-scale producers engaged in plantation-style agriculture with crops tended by African-descended slaves and surpluses not earmarked for a tribal town granary. Less elite Creeks did manage to participate in the changing economy of the Lower South. Whereas in decades past, they had hunted for subsistence and to supply deerskins for the credit-driven transatlantic trade, Creek men and women were now enmeshed in a small-scale cash economy. Of course, as the crowd of grew and American settlement in their midst increased, these entrepreneurs faced growing competition to supply westward travelers. They couldn't compete with men like Clement Freeney, who owned a large, commodious, and as he put it, well-situated public house on the Federal Road, or with other white Americans who had gone into business with Creek headmen to set up profitable taverns, stands, or ferries far outside the bounds of the law. But non-elite Creeks do seem to have been engaged in selling supplies and provisions to travelers when they could spare them. There's also evidence that Creek people managed to earn or extort money from travelers in the form of tolls. According to Lucas Fisher, a Swiss, Swiss businessman and artist who traveled through Creek country in 1824, his party was stopped at nearly every river crossing and required to pay a fee. The typical cost was 50 cents, but on at least one occasion they were required to pay double. Vischer claimed that these tolls and the similarly flexible ferriage fees were deposited in the Creek National Treasury in the form of annual taxes levied on the toll bridges and ferries. But it also seems likely that a significant amount of the money collected in these uh, quotidian transactions never made its way beyond the collector, many of whom were probably not authorized to collect them. Although Vischer occasionally referred to toll officers in his diary without remark, without further remark, he was also accosted at one small bridge by a boy whom he described as, quote, half Indian, half Negro, who demanded 75 cents, a sum Vischer later learned was quite apart from the norm. Despite the growth in Creek commerce as the result of increased travel, by the early 1820s, the, outlooks for Creek, the outlook for Creeks in the South had darkened considerably. The number of immigrants continued to increase, as did the pressure to cede more land. A wholesale removal of the Eastern Indians to lands west of the Mississippi River had been discussed at least since the turn of the 19th century. But with the tremendous success of the market economy, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and the expansion of American territory since 1819, the topic received renewed interest. Even formerly American allied Creek leaders like Big Warrior could not contain their disgust for the profound pressure exerted on them to abandon their homelands. A report on the headman's disposition stated, the chiefs are unwilling to listen to any proposition of the kind. 
representing that their present limits are already too small for their population, that they wish to live in the country, live and die in the country in which they now inhabit. Nevertheless, as happened before, bribes, patronage, and perhaps threats ultimately convinced Coweta headman William McIntosh and a handful of other Creek signatories to cede remaining lands in, the pres in present day Georgia in the Treaty of Indian Springs in 1825. The Treaty of Indian Springs, in my estimation, is by far the most fraudulently, uh, fraudulent, self-interested, and deceitful of all the treaties conducted between the United States and the Creeks to that date. It was signed not in the Creek Nation or in Washington, D.C. with an authorized Creek delegation, but at McIntosh's thriving tavern within the limits of Georgia under the watchful and approving eye of U.S. and Georgia commissioners. McIntosh and his party received significant payment for the session and agreed to be the first to take up lands across the Mississippi. Even those Creeks who had sided with McIntosh in the Creek War, Upper Creek Tuckabatchies under Big Warrior, and Lower Creeks in McIntosh's own province were horrified at this surrender. Protesting the treaty, the Creek National Council told Congress that McIntosh was not authorized, authorized to negotiate such a treaty. Insisting on the sovereign status of the Creek Nation as a nation, they asked, would such a treaty stand made by some noblemen of France or Britain, unauthorized, either by written or verbal power, and would it be insisted upon as lawful? They vowed, as fast as we are knocked in the head, the throats of our wives and children are cut by the first tide of population that know no law, we will then afford to the United States a spectacle of immigration, which we hope may be to a country prepared by the great spirit for the honest and unfortunate Indians. The flood of immigrants that had washed into Creek country in the aftermath of the Creek War not only brought free and unfree American travelers, but it deepened the divisions within the Creek Nation. The pressure exerted on the Creeks by Georgia and Alabama to continually cede more land and constrict the borders of their already shrinking, shrinking nation combined with the constant friction of settlers and slaves scoring the landscape with footfalls, wagon wheels, and cattle hooves, were second only to the despair of a nation still reeling from a bloody civil war. McIntosh was among the first to pay the price. He was executed in accordance with a Creek law that mandated death for anyone who ceded or sold another foot of Creek land. His executioners were primarily former red sticks from the towns of Okfuski and Tallapoosa, but the plan was scripted by leaders Apothle Yaholo and Little Prince. And they were careful to assure their white American neighbors that this was not an act of war, that killing an American allied headman was not an act of war. Instead, they insisted this was a Creek national affair. The American settlers who poured into the Old Southwest in the 1820s may or may not have known about the depths of the Creek divisions or their increasing despair. They were dreaming the great Western dream that had steadily strengthened its grip on the American psyche. In Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and places further west, they saw the promise of fertile, vacant lands and economic opportunity. Immense numbers of Americans abandoned their homes in the Atlantic coast states of the Chesapeake and Upper South and headed for the new purchases to the Southwest. One enslaved man recalled during his forced march that, quote, industry, enterprise, and ambition have fled from these abodes, referring to Maryland and Virginia, and sought refuge from sterility and barrenness in the vales of Kentucky or the plains of Alabama. The Americans pressing into the Creek Nation not only included cattlemen and planters, but also missionaries, hoping to capitalize on the spiritual vulnerability of a defeated native population. Secretary of War William H. Crawford suggested that establishing a school for Indian children would do more for the civilization of the Creek Indians than all of the late Indian agent Benjamin Hawkins' efforts over the previous 30 years. By 1827, there were at least three missionary schools for the education of Indian children, two of which, the Withington and Asbury missions, were located within Creek country itself. Promotional writings depicted American settlement of and profit from the land ceded by the Creeks as natural, inevitable, and right. One advertisement for the sale of lots in a new Alabama town called Florence, 
vigorously asserted, there must, in the natural course of things, spring up one of the largest commercial towns in the interior of the southwestern section of the Union, and implied that the absence of the creeks was necessary to such growth. Another less oblique account in the Blakely Sun and Alabama Advertiser claimed, <clears throat> but yesterday these lands were darkened and overshadowed by the wilderness. Today they are reclaimed from their rude and forbidding state and clustered with towns and villages and decorated with the enchanting embellishments of taste and civilization. Asserting that the land had been reclaimed for American settlement and implying that the Creeks were never rightful proprietors of their homelands, such accounts actively reimagined Creek places as empty spaces and overlaid them with new meanings, industry, enterprise, progress. This process of reimagining Creek places as American spaces depended in part on the continuation of internal improvements in the region. Such improvements, and the phrase itself is telling, right, improvement, uh, like the Federal Road, were seen as essential not only for promoting greater migration into Alabama, but also for the broader economic development of the region. And the creeks were often depicted as the major obstacle to these endeavors. Georgia Governor George Krupp, Troop summarized this position with respect to his state, saying, the great work of internal improvement is suspended, and all because Georgia is not in possession of her vacant territory, a territory waste and profitless to the Indians, profitless to the United States, but in the possession of the rightful owner, a source of strength, of revenue, and of union. The Georgia legislature echoed this sentiment, complaining, the assertion that we have no right to enter the Indian country within our own limits with the peaceable object of internal improvement without the consent of the Indians is a doctrine which this state will not admit. Southern politicians railed vociferously against the Southern Indians as obstacles to internal improvement schemes, such as canals, railroads, and other grand designs. But they seemed to forget that the region's roads, including the old federal road, were in dismal disrepair. And neither a canal nor a railroad would be useful to planters who could not get their produce to the riverside or the depot. Indeed, as late as 1828, a northern traveler described road travel in the south as such. Little pains are taken to make roads, and if a tree should fall across the path, it is not removed until absolutely necessary. Just turn out and drive around it. Good roads and bridges I would, I think, here be a luxury. The overland routes that crossed Creek Country and had caused so much dissent, debate, and dispute just a few years before were neglected in favor of more ambitious projects, leaving one visitor to observe, if, instead of expending their money so lavishly on splendid but visionary schemes of canals and railroads, they would mend their important highway the public would perceive some palpable advantages in their expenditures. But now, all is chimerical and profitless. A further impediment to improving roadways and by extension overland travel through the interior south was that it was still unclear, as late as the mid-1820s, where certain boundaries lay. Without certain knowledge of, for example, the limits of Georgia and Alabama, Legislatures found it difficult to decide how to plan and fund improvement schemes. The 1826 Treaty of Washington, which amended portions of the fraudulent Indian Springs Treaty, signaled the problem when it declared that the lines of the Creek Session were contingent on the boundary lines between Georgia and Alabama. It being understood, the document stated, that these lines are to stop at their intersection with the boundary line between Georgia and Alabama, wherever that may be. Despite the fact that Alabama had been a state since 1819, the border between the two states had never been amicably settled, primarily because a significant portion of it ran through the Creek Nation. So in my remaining time today, I want to highlight the experiences of a man named Richard Blunt, who was sent to survey this line. Blunt's surveyor's journal is housed here at the Alabama Archives, and it's a real gem. In fact, 
if sufficient interest exists, I'm interested in perhaps preparing an edited and annotated version of the journal for use by scholars and the general public. Um, maybe you can let me know during the Q&A what you think about that. Blunt was one of the principal officials appointed to represent the state of Georgia in its efforts to settle the boundary with Alabama, a matter that was deemed essential if road improvement and by extension, travel and immigration were to continue. The controversy focused on the contradictory and bewildering language of the Compact of 1802, in which the state of Georgia ceded its Western claims to the United States in exchange for the promise to extinguish Indian title to lands within their remaining boundaries. At issue was whether the line was to begin at the Great Bend of the Chattahoochee, where the river changes direction from the south, uh, southwest to the south, or whether it was to begin at the confluence of Uchi Creek with the Chattahoochee, a location several miles to the south of the Great Bend. The Georgians maintained that the boundary began at the lower location, which gave them more land. The Alabamians declared that the upper location was correct, of course, to their advantage. It seemed not to matter to either state that the land in question was located in the heart of the Creek Nation. When Blunt arrived in the disputed region, he remarked, surely, if all Georgia could see these sterile, stony knobs they would not contend so strongly with Alabama. For a narrow slip of such land, west of the Chattahoochee, separated by such a river, or be so solicitous to dispossess the forlorn sons of the forest. Considering the weeks spent tracing and retracing the same debated, but in his estimation, overvalued ground, Blunt complained, my patience is tried with a foolish contract. <clears throat> Even while he was engaged in the daily work of running the line designed to slice down the center of remaining creek lands and determine the jurisdiction of either Alabama or Georgia over the creeks, he digressed. How or whence did we get a right to extend the chartered limits of Georgia far to the west over their territory by a grant from George, King of England? And what gave him the prerogative to grant charters for the land of a people rightful owners of the soil, and tenants in possession from time immemorial. Even as he surveyed their land, Blunt questioned the basic principles that undergirded the remapping of Creek country and the dispossession of the Creeks. Such candor is but one reason that I think Blunt's journal deserves more exposure to the general public, because it provides a powerful counterweight to the sort of promotional literature I quoted earlier, that imagined the creeks as already absent and certainly not rightful owners of the soil. And it gives the lie to characterizations of all Southerners as blind or ignorant to the scale of theft that was taking place around them. Another revealing aspect of Blunt's journal are his interactions with creek people during his survey. Just as I've tried to demonstrate with the varied participation of creeks in roadside entrepreneurship, even as late as 1826, they were not resigned to removal or willing to passively accept the loss of their land or their autonomy. As they had done for centuries, the Creeks and their indigenous neighbors creatively adapted to the new circumstances of their lives. Some Creek men acted as paid guides for Blunt's party, working as they had to varying degrees since the earliest European explorations in their nation. Whether they participated solely on the basis of payment or in order to exert some measure of control on the outcome of the survey, um, or some combination of the two, cannot be precisely determined. But they were certainly there every step of the way. Blunt's party circled around and around the area where Uchi Creek empties into the Chattahoochee River, trying to determine whether they had located the true place for the departure of the boundary from the river itself but they frequently relied on the expertise of either Creek collaborators or other local inhabitants hired along the way. Blunt was even provided with a Creek guide who acted as his protector on occasion. One tense situation arose near the end of the expedition when Blunt and his companions were accosted by several Creek men who appeared to be intoxicated. The, the Creeks inquired of his guide, a man named Chochis Miko, who are the commissioners? We intend to kill one. And they upbraided me for being, his pilot, for being the pilot. This is what Chochis Miko reported. 
Just as with the roads through Creek Country, some individuals collaborated while others resisted. And some collaborated in one instance, but resisted in another. Even Chochis Miko never lost sight of his allegiance to his nation no matter what he was paid. For example, Blunt relied on him to procure provisions from local Creeks during the expedition and later complained that he was often forced to pay, as he said, the highest prices for whatever we bought, whether honey, chickens, beef, or corn. Such actions suggest that Creeks in such positions took advantage of these opportunities, however small, to continue to support their communities whenever they could. Likewise, Creek women emerged as enterprising entrepreneurs ready to supply the crowd of strangers moving through their homelands, whether surveyors or immigrants or both. Blunt recorded numerous instances of purchasing watermelons, corn, honeycomb, meat, and other supplies from Creek women and children along the route, as well as their attempts to sell other sundries that the party was typically disinclined to buy. These were, by and large, amicable exchanges in which Creek people, women in particular, were viable producers engaged in the same small market economy that many of their new American neighbors were enlarging. But there were also tense and frustrating encounters in which Creek women displayed their frustration with the surveying party's trespass on their lands. On one occasion, Blunt and his party attempted to procure melons from some Indian women, but could not make themselves understood, even after drawing a picture of a watermelon on the ground. Given the frequency with which they had been supplied with melons before, and Blunt's suspicions that one of the young women had been educated at a missionary school and understood English perfectly well, he concluded, it produces very unpleasant sensations that they pretend not to comprehend us. In another incident, an elderly Creek woman directed a young boy to take up the green corn shucks that were scattered about on the road so that Blunt's horses would not be able to eat them. A small gesture of resistance, to be sure, but Blunt interpreted it to mean that they were inimical to us or our object. It was probably both. Despite the dramatic diminution of their nation during the mid-1820s and the ever-increasing presence of strangers in their midst, many Creeks made every effort to continue on with their lives. One sign of such determination was the persistence of ball plays, an intertown ceremonial sport that had long been central to Creek social and cultural relationships. When travel writer Basil Hall visited the Creek Nation in 1828 and 29, he observed one such ball play. Having heard and believed the rumors that the Creeks were miserable wretches wandering around like bees whose hive had been destroyed, he was stunned by the enthusiasm and organization of this athletic event. Here was evidence that despite the loss of the land, the ascendance of their longtime foe, Andrew Jackson, and the ever louder calls for them to yield their lands to the crowd of strangers who now claimed it as their own, Creek people insisted on their right to perform their ceremonies, their dances, and their games, to supply themselves, to travel the diminished breadth of their nation, and above all, the right to hold themselves together and seek the right path. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Do you have anything you'd like to ask? If you have a question, please raise your hand and speak directly into the microphone. Thank you. Yeah. My first question is the extent to which uh, the Creeks were resorting to violence uh, that gave justification to sending them to Oklahoma. Uh, well, the violence was certainly happening. Um, whether that is viable justification for removal, I'm not sure. I, th I think it might be more of um, convenient cover, um, oh, convenient cover for, for the removal effort. Um, I, I teach a course called the Native South, and one of the things we talk about in that class, we try a couple of counter-historical exercises where we think about what circumstances would have had to happen for removal to not take place for example. 
And so one of the things that, I, that we kind of arrive at as a conclusion or a possible conclusion is that had the Creek War not happened, removal probably would not have happened at least in the same way or at the same time that it did. Um, you know, there, there was a, a real shift in public opinion um, during and after the Creek War. And that was something that nobody could have foreseen, right? Uh, many of the folks, the Red Sticks, who were engaged in that revitalization movement as they saw it, that rebellion, that revolution, um, were engaged in a religious movement that they thought was gonna purify them and that was gonna fix their situation. Um, and that ended up resulting in a whole lot of violence and that violence was seen as a provocation and then was used to recruit new militia from, every, you know, from all over the place um, and to justify sending those militia into the Creek Nation. Um, but if you look at something like the Treaty of Fort Jackson, 1814, at the end of the Creek War, right? If, if the Treaty of Fort Jackson and the sort of punishment that was meted out to the Creeks for the war was just, then it doesn't make sense that Jackson also took land from the friendly Creeks and the Cherokees who fought alongside him at Horseshoe Bend. That's an example of where I think the violence becomes a convenient excuse as opposed to a legitimate justification. Because why take land from your friends who haven't been violent to you, right? When you look in um, deed records, early deed records in Alabama county courthouses, you see the purchase of land from someone with a Muscovian name. Could you talk about, I mean, what, what, under what authority does that individual, was there a concept then later uh, pre-removal that <clears throat> Indians had land ownership similar to a European concept? Yes, um, I'm, it's, a, it's a big complicated issue. Let me, let me address what I think are sort of the two main parts. One is that I think a lot of us have a sort of preconceived notion that American Indians did not have a sense of property. Um, and on the one hand, that's true if we're comparing it to English common law right, to property that is what we call alienable, right, that you own it as an individual, that you can, um, that it can be passed down, inherited to members of your family, that it can be sold, um, alienated, right, to, to other people. Um, so if that's the way we define property, then that's true, that many American Indians, including the Creeks, did not traditionally use that notion to, to understand how they um, held their land. One of the things that I try to do in the early part of my book is to show that despite the absence of some of those you know, legal notions of property from the English point of view, Creeks had a very strong sense of their territory. They knew where their boundaries were. Um, they knew when people trespassed. They had, um, they had fights between towns when people were hunting on land that was from a different tribal town. Um, they had disputes between people about their, uh, about their fields. So they often worked in fields as, uh, you know, in common, but they had private fields as well. So, so that's kind of the one, the one thing, is that there is this, there are different ways in which we have to define property, right? The other thing that, that happens is that, um, and, and my book doesn't really go after removal. There's some great books, the, the Second Creek War, um, an older book called Rednecks, Ruffle Shirts, and Redskins, you may be familiar with, that talks about the allotment controversies in the Creek Nation during the era shortly after the removal treaties are signed. What happens then is that allotments of land are, or individual parcels of land are deeded to uh, Creek or Muscogee owners. And then there is a wholesale um, incredible theft <laughs> that takes place to take that land from them. And it takes place in all different kinds of ways. Um, so for example, the uh, speculators, land speculators, would meet a Creek person on the road and say, um, I'll give you $10 if you'll go with me to the, to the land agent and say that you're so-and-so, whose land I really want. And the, the land agent didn't care whether or not that Creek person was who the, who the uh, Anglo settler said they were. Um, they would bring in children. They would use children's names, right, to, to sort of um, get the land that way. They would uh, have land deeded to somebody who was dead. Um, there were all different kinds of fraud. Um, and there are some, uh, in Mary Young's book, The Rednecks, Ruffle Shirts, and Redskins, 
Um, she really goes into and details how all that happened. Um, and it, it shouldn't be understood, however, that the Creeks were swindled in this way because they didn't understand the concept of property. Right? I mean, that's kind of one of the things that sometimes follows from that analysis is that, well, this happened because they were ignorant of how property worked. Not so. Um, it happened because they were desperate, because $10 on the road today meant the survival of your children or you, as opposed to a piece of land that you probably were not going to be able to keep and inhabit anyway. Right? So we have to put it in context of the kind of desperation that was, um, that was you know, really um, widespread among the Creeks at that time. Mm -hmm. First one would be um, something you said just recently that the Creeks were very aware of their boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, from the map that was up uh, early on, it looked as though not all those boundaries were natural or such things as rivers or creeks. Mm -hmm. uh, how were they able to determine and be so certain of what their boundaries were? And the second one was has to do with Richard Watt. Mm -hmm. And um, whether or not his survey was ratified, so to speak, and when, when it might have been ratified. Well, I'll start with the second one first. Um, and it's been a little while since I worked with Blunt's journal, but if I remember correctly, um, the, the dispute continued after his survey was completed. Um, they, he was the Georgia representative, and the Alabama representatives did not agree with, his, with the outcome of his survey. So the dispute went on for, for quite some time. Um, what does happen that begins to clarify things is that the Creeks signed the Treaty of Washington in, in, in you know, 1832 and are ultimately removed, and that makes it a little bit easier for surveyors to kind of go back in and, and um, figure this out. But um, considering I was just in Phoenix City yesterday and they told me that they're on Eastern Standard Time because of their relationship to Fort Benning, I don't know that the boundary is really settled exactly down there. Um, uh, with respect to the first question, they, they understood their boundaries in a number of ways, and that's one of the things that I actually spend quite a bit of time in the book talking about. Um, so one way had to do with their mythology, the stories that they told, origin stories, um, and stories, you know, stories about where they came from. So the Casitas, for example, had a story about they migrated from the west into the east, and they walked and walked and walked, following this stick that was leaning, and then they finally got to a place at a river, and they, and they, were, they understood that's where they were supposed to stop. And so they, they, and that's just one example. There are lots of different stories that they would tell about why not only this place belonged to them in that sort of notion of property, but why they belonged to that place, which is a different concept in a lot of ways, right? Um, they had other ways. They marked the land. So they marked the trees. Um, they marked stones. They modified the landscape in ways that were really not that dissimilar to what surveyors did with hatch marks and, and survey marks and boundary markers on stones and trees and that kind of thing. So there were those kind of visible, tangible landscape markers as well. And then there were diplomatic traditions, we might call them, between the different Indian nations in the South. So um, during certain treaty conventions, for example, the US commissioners would be trying to acquire a session of land from the Creeks. And the Choctaws and, and Chickasaws and, and Cherokees would show up and say, not so fast, because we have something to say about whose land that actually is. So there were generations of diplomatic um, agreements and sort of you know, uh, internal memory within the nations about whose land was whose. Um, and you're right, it didn't always follow a river, but it might have been that your hunting grounds only went so far um, and ours came right up to it. Or maybe we share some space. There was a place called Turkey Town, for example, that was shared between the Creeks and the Cherokees. And the US commissioners never could quite wrap their brains around that, that they shared some of those towns. Um, but those kind of things, the stories, the landmarks, and that diplomatic um, history are part of how they defined where those boundaries were. Did the Indians set up produce stalls, or was it because the travelers were passing through their particular land? 
Um, you mean in order to provide them with provisions and that sort of thing? Yeah, it varied. It depended on um, it depended on where they were. You know, sometimes if we're talking about individual um, sort of suppliers, it was often women, and they would have a kind of like a personal or a family garden. And whenever they had some surplus, they would go out on the road. They would sell uh, the sur- you know surplus corn or something that they might have. They might go and sell a cow, um, you know, uh, beef cattle or something like that. Um, They also would sell baskets, you know, melons, other kinds of things that were relatively simple for them to transport. Um, In other cases, you had people like William McIntosh, very, very wealthy Coweta Lower Creek leader who had multiple plantations and was, you know, had many slaves who worked on his plantations who helped him to produce, you know, um, massive quantities of corn that he could then supply actual stores that would be along the that would be along the path, um, and it really just depended on the means of the traveler, you know, um, and which path they were going on and how much they needed at a certain time, whether or not they would accept the offer of, you know, a lone Creek woman with a few ears of corn to sell or whether they would go on to a particular store or tavern or as they called them, uh, houses of entertainment, which were usually more boring than it sounds like. (laughs) Um, More like a, what do you think, like a rest stop, right? Um, It kind of just depended on where they were and what they needed at the time. Increasingly, those those individual entrepreneurs, men and women, were edged out, um, both by Americans who came in and set up their own stands and taverns and so on, and by their own headmen who were um, in, you know, enlarging their businesses as much as they could. Do we have another question? Here's one. At what period did the uh, people of mixed heritage have to pick a side and stop being Indian and start being American? Uh, I don't know that they ever did. I, I'm. Um, I think that a lot of the dichotomies about mixed ancestry wear thin under close inspection. Um, there were people on the Red Sticks, for example, who were of mixed ancestry. Some of them were very wealthy. Um, some of them were people who owned livestock, owned large parcels of land and that sort of thing. And they made the decision to join the Red Stick Party because of allegiance to their family members, because of um, they, they believe that they should live and die in their homelands, that sort of thing. I think that for a long time, our history, the writing of the history of, of Creeks and other Southeastern Indians has, has fallen into this either or, right? So that we see people like William McIntosh as um, not as a rural individual, but as someone who um, is, is clearly European in his leanings and that sort of thing. But his mother was a Wind Clan woman. His mother was, he was, according to matrilineal kinship, he was raised as a Creek in many ways. And those Creek women were not about to let him escape from that as much as they were able to exert some power and influence over him, they tried to do so. Um, I mean, certainly it was difficult for those individuals. It was difficult because particularly if they had influential Scots-Irish fathers, for example, who were you know, sort of uh, leaning on them, pressuring them, training them to follow in their footsteps, they were often put in situations where they had to make difficult decisions that, that made them choose one allegiance over the other. But I don't really think that any of those folks ever thought of themselves as totally one thing or totally another. There's a great book, actually, I would recommend called, um, by Claudio Sant called Black, White, and Indian, Race and the Making, Unmaking of an American Family. And one of the things he does in that book is traces a particular family, the Griersons. They later change it to Grayson. And they're situated in the Creek Nation. Robert Gerson's a Scots-Irish trader. He marries a Creek woman. And they have a lot of children. And Claudio, in that book, follows the path of two particular children, William and Katie. William marries a slave, manumits her, and goes on to have a sort of life with her with these mixed-race African and Creek children. His sister, Katie, um, repudiates this child that she has with an African man and goes on and marries a Creek man and becomes a very, very wealthy slave owner herself. And I think that's a fascinating book because it shows how um, people, even though they weren't necessarily saying, "I'm, I'm this or I'm that, the choices that they made with respect to other human beings, not only their family members, but the African descended people in their midst, um, really led them on totally different paths. We have time for one more question. When the federal road was laid out, it was in 1805, and it went southwest. Yet Mobile had been there for a long, long time. 
before that. Where was the line between the European influence of Mobile and the Creek influence uh, from the center of what's Alabama now and then the part of that was the Choctaw influence also? How far up the river did the Mobile influence go when the Federal Road was created? Oh, now you're asking me something I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The Federal Road didn't go to Mobile. It went to Fort Stoddard. Okay. How long had Fort Stoddard and been there? Fort Stoddard um, had been there only a little while when they started to lay out the post path. And it was, you know, it, was, it had to be a post path because it was unconstitutional to appropriate money to build anything else, right? Um, but there may be folks in the audience who know more about the influence of Mobile. I mean, certainly Mobile... You know, you think about places like Mobile and Natchez and New Orleans as persisting with a strong um, multicultural European character for a very long time. Um, how far that extended inland, it, I don't know. It would be hard, to, really hard to measure or map that because are we talking about settlers? Are we talking about people, land ownership? Are we talking about diplomacy? Um, so I'm afraid I can't be, you know, more, more decisive about that. But um, it's, it's a great question, fascinating. Who owned Fort uh, It was an American fort. <coughs> okay. Yeah. You might want to make sure that you come back for our August architecture program, Greg Walsicoff will be here, and he's probably going to give you some answers on the same. I'm sure he, yes, absolutely, I'm certain of it. <laughs> yeah, I would, the, the branch had been all the way up to Fort Toulouse. Mm -hmm. That that's his question. That's, yes, if, if, that's your, if that's part of what you're interested in about the sort of infiltration of European influence into the Creek Nation, that's exactly right. The Creeks allowed the French to come in and build Fort Toulouse. They largely did it to irritate the British. <laughs> um, they never, the French never really supplied Fort Toulouse. Of course, the French never really supplied any of their colonial outposts, which is part of what, you know, why everything sort of fell to pieces for them. Um, but there was, con you know, there was continued imperial competition between those European powers for quite some time. And I think maybe even longer than most of us who are interested in Southern history really think about, because we very, we, we move the black, white, antebellum South back in time in a way that's really anachronistic. It was a very, very diverse place um, for a very, very long time. So, so maybe that's a somewhat unsatisfactory answer to your question. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Hudson will be here for a few minutes if you would like to talk with her more, more questions for her, or to sign your book, which are available for sale in the lobby. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. Sure. Thank you.